started last time talking about part one. We got through a page, maybe a page and a half. Um, I want to go over a few uh, key points that we absolutely have to be clear about before moving on. So first is, and you should stop me if this isn't clear. Uh, first point is that we're working here in part one from what Kant takes to be our common sense moral knowledge. So we're analyzing what we all already know in order to try to work toward eventually the supreme principle of morality, the fundamental moral principle. Second, um, <coughs> while many things are good or valuable under certain circumstances, what we're looking for is something that's unconditionally valuable and can serve as the basis or condition for other things to be valuable as well. Um, and the answer is a good one. That's the thing which is unconditionally good. Uh, that's the thing that is the condition for other things being good as well. Um, and you should be thinking here, uh, when we talk about goodwill, basically, we'll, we'll talk about a variation later today, but basically you should be, th talking, you should be thinking about a person, a good person viewed from the point of view of her agency, viewed from the point of view of her actions, viewed from the point of view of what she does. Um, okay, so that the, the claim is a good person is the thing that is unconditionally good. Um, and other things then are going to be good conditionally. Some other things are going to be good conditionally. Um, when they are attached in the right way to a good person, to a good will. And attached in the right way basically means other things are good, that is, they're conditionally good, when either they are willed as an end by a good will. So when a good will takes something as an object of willing, well, if that will has willed properly, then that end is good, objectively. Or if something is instrumentally valuable to a good will. So if a good will, if something is useful to a good will in achieving its end, then it's instrumentally useful in that way. Um, okay. Um, I also said that what makes a will a good will is that it wills properly whatever that means. And we have to worry about that. Um, I think I said uh, it wills the proper ends for the proper reasons, something like that. Um, but, as we saw at the end last time, um, its success or failure in achieving its ends um, doesn't make the will a good one or a bad one. Um, and this is because um, so what makes a will good is not its success or failure in achieving its ends, but willing those ends properly, willing the proper ends in the right way. And that's because um, if, uh, if its success, sorry, if its value were dependent on its success in achieving its ends, then it would not be unconditionally good. It would conditionally good. It would be good conditional on its actual success in achieving its ends. So the point is simply often we will our ends properly, but as it were, the world doesn't cooperate and we fail to achieve those proper ends that we have. Um, okay. 
there's a subtle point here that I, I want to make sure we're clear about. And that is this. On the one hand, whenever we will, we will and act. Whenever our will is active, so to speak, there's some goal that we have that we're trying to accomplish. And furthermore, when we will an end, we take that end, we take that goal to be in some way or other worth bringing about. We take that goal that we will in some sense to be good. So whenever we will, we will an end, and we take that end in some sense to be good, to be worth pursuing. So I say it's subjectively good at least. We take it, it seems good to us, we take it to be good. Um, now, Uh, we might be wrong about that. We're fallible. And so what we take to be good, and will, as an end, may in fact not be good. Um, but I say again, at least it seems good in some sense um, to us. So it might not actually be good, that is, that end might not be objectively good, um, and that's what happens when we will improperly. Okay, but the point is this. Um, if whenever we will, we will an end that we take to be good, then a failure to achieve that end is a kind of failure. It means that we are not achieving something that we take to be valuable. We're not achieving something that we take to be good. And so that's bad, or at least seems bad to us. It's subjectively bad. So I say one more time. A failure to achieve our end, when we will an end, but the world doesn't cooperate and we don't achieve it, that seems to us, and actually is sometimes, bad. But I thought the whole point was that what makes a will a good one has nothing to do with its success or failure in achieving its ends. That's right. So what I'm saying here is that when we assume we will properly, we take some end to be good, to be valuable. We will it properly, let's say. We pursue it. We try to bring it about and say we fail. So on the one hand, that's a bad thing. We didn't bring about that good end. That's bad. But that failure, in this case, does not reflect a failure on the part of our will. Our will still, I, I stipulated, I assume, will the proper end properly. It just didn't achieve it. So the badness here is not a badness of the will. It's a badness of the world, so to speak. Okay. So a failure to achieve a proper end doesn't reflect badly on the will. It's still a good will. Its value is not dependent on its success or failure in achieving certain ends. But there is a, a kind of badness here, it's a badness in the world. The world has failed to achieve, uh, the, the, will, the world has failed to be good in a certain way. So a failure to achieve our end is bad. That doesn't mean we have a bad will, however. If we willed properly, that is, if the end would have been good if it had been achieved, then a failure means the world is less good. So remember, a good will is not the only good. It's the only unconditional good. So a failure to achieve our proper ends is a bad thing, but it doesn't make our will bad. Okay, 
And last point by way of review, uh, I want to emphasize that willing is not mere wishing or hoping. It's not just thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice if a certain thing were the case. Instead, willing is active, and it means taking some end to be valuable, to be good, to be worth pursuing, and striving to make ourselves the means by which that end is achieved. Uh, making ourselves the cause of that end, that goal. Um, so to repeat, uh, we don't always succeed in achieving our ends, um, but unless we are genuinely trying to achieve our ends, not genuinely trying to bring them about, we're not actually willing them, but maybe hoping or wishing that they happen instead. Okay, so that's review. Let me see if there are questions about that. Right. So remember, a good will is not the only good. It's the only unconditional good, he says. But that's precise, and it's the condition for other things being good. But that's precisely the point. Other things really can be good when they are related to a good will in the right way. Questions? If I were to ask you on a quiz, for example, the difference between willing and wishing, you get it, yes? Yeah. If I were to ask you on a quiz, for example, whether good will is the only thing that's good, you know that it's not the only thing that's good. It's the only thing that's unconditional. You would know what conditions make other things good related in the right way to a good will. Either willed as an end by good will, or valuable means by which a will can achieve its proper end. Okay. Alright, so uh, Kant thinks that this unconditional value of a good will, look, of a good person, Kant thinks that this unconditional value of a good person uh, is confirmed by, as I say, common sense morality, but he still thinks that it may strike us a little as a little bit odd. So we should examine it from the point of view, he says, of the purpose of reason, the purpose that nature has given to reason. So for us, this is not going to confirm very much because we find it odd to talk about nature having purposes at all. Um, so we can read the next few paragraphs as a kind of digression. Um, but Kant does make some valuable and important points for understanding his view before resuming uh, his main argument. Um, so, bottom of 10, um, on to 11. He says, um, very bottom, last line of page 10, uh, 395. It says, we assume as a principle that no organ will be found in, in a creature for any end that it is not the most fitting for it and the most suitable. Um, so let's consider, he says, the purpose of our organ, our capacity, for practical reason. Um, and imagine that this capacity were only valuable <coughs> for the purpose of uh, the beneficial results that our happiness. So uh, imagine that we thought our capacity to will, that is our practical reason, were, so to speak, given to us by nature 